we're going to wrap up our discussion of open and closed sets in the place where actually in general point set topology you tend to begin the discussion of open sets and closed sets and that is to look at how openness behaves as we try to build new open sets from old open sets. So what I mean by that is we want to look in this video at the question of what happens to openness if I take the union of open sets together? Is it still open? What about intersection? If I intersect open sets together, will the results still be open? And the beautiful thing is, in our previous video, we got this understanding that openness and closeness are not opposites, but they're complements of one another. That closed sets are just the complements of open sets. And the good news is, that means that what we discover about unions and intersections of open sets in this video, we immediately will be able to deduce something about unions and intersections of closed sets, because closed is the complement of open. Let's see what I mean. So our goal here is going to be to figure out how we can say that the union of open sets is open or the intersection of open sets is open. Those are statements that are not sufficiently qualified at this point. We want to figure out under what circumstances can we expect this to be true. So here's a picture. Suppose I have two open sets, A and B. I'm going to kind of sketch them as though they don't include their boundaries, right? Under what circumstances do I think that the union of A with B can be an open set? Well, let's sort of try to flesh this out. Let's pick a point that lives in the union of A with B. Well, what does it mean to reside in the union of A with B? Well, it means that it could be a point in A, or it could be a point in B, or it could be both, but it can't be neither, right? What we know for sure is that X belongs to A or X belongs to B. But A and B are each open sets by our assumption. So if X belongs to A, for example, then that means that there is an epsilon neighborhood of X that resides entirely within the set A, right? X is interior to A. That's what open set meant. All of its points are interior points. Similar statement for B. If X belongs to B, then X is interior to B because B is an open set. But then what do each of those criteria mean? They mean epsilon neighborhoods, right? If X is interior to A, that means there exists an epsilon neighborhood of X that lives entirely within the set A, so entirely within my blue ellipse here, right? So there's an epsilon neighborhood, let's call it epsilon one as the radius here. And then similarly for the set B, because X is interior to B, there exists an epsilon neighborhood, we'll call it epsilon two, of X that resides entirely within the set B. So depending on whether I'm an element of A or whether I'm an element of B, either this blue statement is going to be true or the orange statement is going to be true. It's also possible that they might both be true. So what are we trying to deduce here? If I want to deduce that the union is an open set, I need to find an epsilon neighborhood of X that resides entirely as a subset of the union of A with B. But we actually have more than we need here because we have already an epsilon one neighborhood, which is a subset of A, and A is a subset of A union B by definition of union. We also have a second epsilon neighborhood, this epsilon two neighborhood of X, which is entirely a subset of B in the case where X happens to be an element of B. But then B itself is also a subset of the union of A with B. So no matter whether X belonged to A or X belonged to B, I'm going to get an epsilon neighborhood of X that is entirely a subset of A union B. So when I read those things from left to right, what we've just proven is that X in either one of these cases is an interior point of A union B. So no matter what X I pick in the union of A with B, that X is going to be interior to A union B. So we have proven that A union B is an open set. So how far have we gotten here? We've shown that the union of two open sets is guaranteed to be an open set. That's a promising start. What if we try intersection instead of union? What changes? So here, the intersection is just that portion of this Venn diagram here in the overlap of A with B. So let's pick an arbitrary X inside of that intersection. And we want to try to show, if we can, that that X is an interior point of the intersection of A with B. Well, if X belongs to the intersection, we know that two things must both be true that X belongs to A and also that X belongs to B. Well, since A is an open set, that means that X is an interior point of A. And since B is an open set, that means that X is an interior point of B. So right now we know that X, X is interior to A and also X is interior to B. So 
that x is interior to a means that there exists an epsilon ball around x which is entirely a subset of a, and that x is interior to b means that there exists an epsilon neighborhood around x that is entirely a subset of b as well. So looking in my diagram here, let's call epsilon 1 my radius of my epsilon ball, which is entirely a subset of A, so it's this one here. And then let's let epsilon 2 be the radius of my epsilon ball that's entirely a subset of B, which is a little bit bigger here. So we're getting two different epsilon balls, and both of them are kind of in play in my proof because both of these statements, x belongs to A and x belongs to B, are also true at the same time, right, because x belongs to the intersection. So we get an epsilon 1 ball, we're calling it, which is a subset of A, and we get an epsilon 2 neighborhood, which is entirely a subset of B. This is actually a little bit harder than the proof was for union, because one of these epsilon balls might actually slop outside of the intersection of A with B, the way that I've drawn it here. This epsilon 2 ball that's larger is going outside of the intersection. It's still a subset of B because X is an interior point of B, but it might not be a subset of A intersection B. So that is the wrinkle in this part of the proof. But at least the smaller one of the epsilon balls, whichever that smaller one is, will be a subset of the intersection. It's a subset of A, and it's a subset of the larger epsilon ball, which is a subset of B. Therefore, this smaller ball is going to be a subset of the intersection of A with B. So if I want to find an epsilon ball around X, which is a subset of the intersection, I should just take whichever of these two epsilon balls had the smaller radius. Take epsilon equal to the minimum of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. If I do that, then I know for sure that epsilon is less than or equal to epsilon 1. The radius of my epsilon ball is, is less than or equal to the radius of my epsilon 1 ball. And therefore, that the epsilon ball around x is going to be a subset of the epsilon 1 ball around x. Same thing with epsilon 2. Because epsilon is the smaller of the two of these, it means that epsilon is less than or equal to epsilon 2. And so the epsilon ball is a subset of the epsilon 2 ball. And so my epsilon ball, b epsilon of x, is a subset of both b epsilon 1 and b epsilon 2 of x. And therefore, b epsilon of x is a subset of the b epsilon 1 ball around x, which is a subset of a. And also, the epsilon ball around x is a subset of the epsilon 2 ball around x, which is a subset of b. Therefore, the epsilon ball around x is a subset of the intersection of a with b, which is exactly what we were hoping for. Because now we've shown that every x in the intersection of a with b is interior to the intersection of a with b. So that means that a intersect b is an open set, proving that the intersection of two open sets is open. So, so far so good, right? At least if I have two open sets, I can take their union and get a new open set. I can also take their intersection and get a new open set. And because I can do it with two, I know that I can do it for more than two, just by using a proof by induction that I won't write out formally here, but I'll sort of make the argument, right? If A1 and A2 are open, then the intersection of A1 with A2 is also open, for example. And so if I have a third open set, and I take the intersection with those first two, then because the intersection of the first two was open, and the third one is open, I can just apply this fact, the intersection of two open sets is open, to deduce that A1 intersect A2 quantity uh, intersect A3 is also open and by the associativity of intersections of sets with other intersections, right? I can just remove these parentheses and say a1 intersect a2 intersect a3 will be open. Right? So the same thing would also be true of unions, right? The union of three open sets is open. The intersection of three open sets is open and so on and so on and so on. No matter how many k sets that I have, if I have a collection of k open sets, if I take the intersection of all k of those open sets, I'm going to get an open set. If I take the union of all k of those open sets, I'm going to get an open set as well. So this is actually really, really good news. You give me some finite collection of open sets, I can take the union of that whole collection and get an open set. I can take the intersection of that whole collection and get an open set. But the problem is if we try to push this from the realm of the finite into the realm of the infinite, this is where a lot of very good arguments get dashed against the rocks on the beach, right? 
this is the kind of the story of calculus and the story of analysis is trying to take our understandings about finite things and impute them to infinite things. It doesn't always work the way that we want it to work. So in the next video, we're going to figure out how far we can extend this notion of the union of k-sets uh, remaining open if the k-sets were open and the intersection of k-open sets remaining open. We're going to see how far we can push this notion and what is the right way to think about the algebra of open sets and therefore also of closed sets.